Okay. So, hope you guys ha all had a great summer. It's kind of fun when I get a bunch of you guys that have I've already gone through one of my classes. It makes life easy. Uh, you already know the program. Today is going to be totally boring for you, but such is life. It's the first day, so you get a pass today. Uh, but for those of you that aren't here, you can listen to all my all my stuff and my spiel to get to get ready for the semester. This is Digital Tools for Architects. Uh, it's Architecture 136 for the fall of 2018. Uh, hopefully you all had a good summer and we're back ready to do to, to go for it. To this semester is a little bit different than last semester. My guess is that you were aware of this on your schedules because class is going to be at different times. It's not the old times and it's only 16 weeks instead of 18 weeks. So life is different. We'll accommodate and we'll adapt. Uh, but it probably means there'll be a little bit more work outside of class uh, because we have less days to try to work it in. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, a lot of you already know me, so that's great. But if not, if you haven't been in one of my classes before, um, my name is Grant Adams. I am an associate professor of architecture here at DVC, which basically means that I'm here two days a week. I'm here on Mondays and on Wednesdays. I teach two classes. 135, my other class, which a lot of you have already taken, is in the morning before this class, and then I teach this class. I was hired uh, 11 years ago to start teaching 135. And along the way, I would say probably eight years ago, I talked Daniel into starting this class, which is 136. Um, so I was very much in favor of having 136 as an important class for you guys, but it came after 135. Uh, and they're meant to go together. If you haven't taken 135 and you're taking 136, that's OK. You don't need the stuff in 135 to succeed in 136. You could take them out of order doesn't really matter. But by the time you're done with both 135 and 136, you should have a pretty good understanding of these various software packages and how you can use them in the world of architecture to represent your ideas. And that's certainly the goal. A little bit more about my background. Uh, I have a Master of Architecture degree from UC Berkeley. I also have my undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley, so I have a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture as my undergraduate degree. So that's considered a four-year plus two-year program. So I have four years undergrad plus two years to get my master's degree. If that's, that's one route, the other route would be if you were, uh, let's say you went to Cal Poly, you'd do five years. It's a five-year degree, a Bachelor of Architecture, slightly different, and then you would go to one year of a master and get your master's degree. So total, they end up being six years. So it really doesn't matter whether you go Berkeley plus two, or four year plus two, or Cal Poly plus one, or a five year plus one. Doesn't matter, you'll get in the same place. Um, so that's my background. I obviously have a lot of ties to Berkeley, though it's been long enough since I was in school at Berkeley that things have changed. So when people ask me about certain things or who were the good professors, almost everybody that I had aren't there anymore. So. Things have changed a bit. Um, my advice isn't, isn't as good, though I do have a few people that you need to take classes from if you move on. Emails for me, you're more than welcome to email me at either address. Uh, gadams at dvc.edu is my official DVC email address. You can use that to get to me or grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. That's fine. If you email me on one, you might get a reply from the other, um, but it is what it is. I do do work outside of being a teacher. so. I'm usually like on a job actually doing work the other days of the week. So if you email me or text me, chances are I'm not going to answer because <laughs> I'm busy. Uh, but I'll try my best to respond uh, and get back to you. If you call me, there's a very good chance that I won't answer. <laughs> so we'll just be clear about that. But you're more than welcome to text me. There's a phone number for you to be able to text me. Uh, if you get stuck on something, I'll try to get you unstuck as best I can. My office hours. And again, the times got all wonky this semester because the times got wonky this semester. Um, Mondays, 6.55 to 7.55 in the morning. That's more for my 135 class for people that want to be able to talk to me before class because they can't talk after because I have this class. Um, so that's 6.55 to 7.55 on Monday. The opposite uh, we'll do after on Wednesday. So 2.15, which is when we get out of this class, to 3.15 will be my office hours on Wednesdays. So you can stay after class and talk to me on Wednesday. Though the truth is, and you guys have been, a lot of you have taken classes with me before, basically if I'm here, I'm more than happy to talk to you. If I'm not here, then I can't talk to you. But those are my official designated office hour times. If I'm not in this room, 
if I'm not here in 103 slash 104 slash 108, depending on which map you look at. If I'm not in this room, I'll be in my office, which is uh, 104B, which is directly across the hallway there. Um, so you're more than welcome to talk to me at any of those times if you would like. There is a website for the class. It's the same website as 135. So if you took 135, you're already really familiar with it. Nothing has really changed. DigitalToolsForArchitects.com is the website. You'll visit this website for a variety of reasons, many of which we'll go over today, a lot of which revolve around basically all the course content. You'll post your assignments and your exercises to the course website. If you want paper copy, if you want uh, to reprint your syllabus, you can find it on there. If you want to reprint the exercise, you can find it on there. Um, I have all kinds of tutorials. I have all the lecture videos on there. So there's plenty of content on there. Um, and we'll go through it in a little bit more detail today so you can see where all of this content is as we go forward. Um, I just threw a bunch of uh, random little things in there that are Rhino models so you can see kind of where we're going as part of this class. So they'll be interspersed with the slides today. The course schedule, there'll be a course calendar um, and it's actually very up to date. I went through and, and kind of modified it because of the 16 week semester. So I have what I think we're gonna be doing every day already put in. We're gonna be here on Mondays and Wednesdays from 11.10. So it's different than previous semesters where we start 10 minutes later than we used to start in this class. So we're gonna go from 11.10 to 12.10-ish as my lecture time. This class is a little bit different than 135, and I, I know I talk in the beginning here a lot about 135 versus 136. It's easiest for me to explain to people who have already taken 135 some of the differences and draw that because it makes the connections. If you didn't take 135, don't worry. It's not a big deal that I'm drawing all these connections to 135, uh, but sometimes it's easiest to explain it in that context. So um, anyway, we're going to start at 11.10 to 12.10 will be the lecture time. Most of the lecture stuff in this class won't be me standing up giving a big lecture on things. It'll be demonstrations. This is how you learn to model in Rhino. This is how we're going to render in V-Ray. And we'll do a little bit of that later on today. We'll actually get open Rhino and we'll build something today. So um, it'll be more instruction-based rather than broad topic-based. That's going to be 11.10 to 12.10, though in this class that varies quite a bit because depending on what I'm trying to teach, I may teach part of it, pause, you guys work for a while, then I'll come back and keep going. Sometimes my talk will ta last longer. Sometimes I'll do something, pause, we'll do a rendering, and that'll take a while, and then I'll come back and keep going. So there's, it's a little bit more in flux than in 135, uh, where we, it's a kind of a concise, this is when I talk, this is when you work. So it'll flex a little bit more. 2, uh, 1210 to 215 is your lab portion of the class. So that's when you're actually going to be doing the lab exercise each day. Um, but like I said, it's going to vary a little bit in this class. We already talked about office hours, so we'll continue on past that. This is the course description. Basically, it says that we're going to use Rhino and V-Ray, and we're going to do some stuff. If you really are interested, you can read it. Course software. So we're going to be working in this class in Rhino 5 and V-Ray 1.5. Much to my grumbling, we're stuck in V-Ray 1.5 for another uh, year. So I tried really, really hard to talk everybody into upgrading us, but the powers that be decided that it was, quote, too expensive. So they weren't going to do it. Sorry, it is what it is. Uh, my hands are tied. So we're stuck with Rhino 5, and we're stuck with V-Ray uh, 1.5. That is not necessarily a bad thing. You can get great, high-quality results out of these two programs. There's some subtle differences between Rhino 5 and Rhino 6, though they're not too significant. There's some pretty major differences between V-Ray 1.5 and V-Ray 3, which is the new version that's out, which is what I was trying for. Most of the V-Ray changes have to do with how they organize it and how they name things. So all the stuff is still there. You just have to understand how to to cross over. Um, so the skills that you're learning in V-Ray 1.5 are the same as the skills in Rhino or in V-Ray 3. They're just called different things. So you have to kind of sort through it. If you end up working in V-Ray 3 for some reason and you need help translating, I can help you do that. Um, we are, however, going to be working in these two programs. If you want to uh, get a student version of Rhino on your home computer, that's great. I have heard, and policies change, so I'm a little bit out of date, but I've heard that they do offer a student version trial. Uh, that version lasts for 90 days. So if you're going to do it, figure out when the end of the semester is and do your trial starting 90 days before the end of the semester, if that makes sense. So you have it through the end of the semester. 
in the beginning, the stuff that we're doing is not so complicated that you can't just do it in lab. So it'll actually be a while in this class before you have an official first assignment, because I've got to get all of you up to speed to be able to model something. So there's some learning curve before we get too in, into it, which means that you have some time before you really need your own version. Some people ask, should I get, should I buy, slash find a trial version, slash find another version of V-Ray for your home computer? The truth is, no, you shouldn't, because your home computer can't render as well as the network can render here. Or um, I'm working with the computer department, the IT department, to build a uh, rendering server where it actually has a bunch of extra cores and can render faster than any of these computers. So they're in process of building one, which should be pretty cool this semester if we can make it work. Um, so the truth is that any of your rendering stuff you really don't want to do on your home computer because it'll take way too long anyway. So we'll get to that. That means V-Ray is going to be done primarily here. So there's a few other things that we will do as part of the class. Um, we will build some um, physical models. You'll do some laser cutting. We'll build a topography out of cardboard. So you'll learn the process of getting something from the digital world of Rhino out to building something physical. And we will also do 3D printing. So here's a bunch of the, the little 3D prints from last year. We'll build little, little buildings, little shapes, little objects. There's a bunch of these. And I will teach you how to do that. It's going to be slightly better than last year, I hope, because the computers were re-imaged and some special software was put on here that will help you get your files ready to 3D print. Um, previously, that software was only available in the 3D printer room. So it's now here, so you'll be able to learn it here, and you'll be able to get your G codes ready to actually do the printing. So the hope is that we'll kind of streamline that process. This part, the 3D prints, are still rather experimental. It may not work. You may not actually get a 3D print out, but the goal is for you to have a 3D print by the end of the semester. So we'll get there, uh, and that's certainly part of what we're trying to do. There is a required textbook for the class. If you already bought it in 135, the same one will work just fine. It's the Digital Tools for Architects Handbook. It's a print-on-demand book. So you order it, and then three or five days later, it gets shipped to you because they actually make the book to ship it to you. There's no big stock of books. Okay? So they'll print it. If you can uh, do a Google search for Lulu coupon codes and you can get a discount on it, by all means, get a discount on it. Doesn't matter to me. It's the publisher that gets all the money anyway. Okay? So it's here. This is useful because you can go in and see all those tutorials all those step by steps. And you can take notes in here so that down the road when you're trying to remember how on earth you did something, you have your notes to go back to, as opposed to some random piece of paper somewhere that you jotted the note on the corner and can't find. So it's there for you uh, as part of the class. But like I said, if you already have the book from a previous semester, just use that book. There's, there's no reason to, to buy it again. So there is no midterm or final exam for this class. There's no big test. I'm not going to say, you know, show me how to do uh, you know, curved networks or something. Uh, there's no test. There's no way for me to test you in these abilities. But your grade is going to be based on the following. And if you took 135, this should look really, really familiar. 20% of your grade is your lab exercises. And we'll talk about what each of these things are in a little bit more depth as we go forward. Uh, but 20% of your grade is those lab exercises. 40% of your grade is your assignments. There will be fewer assignments in this class than there were in 135. I think there'll be four assignments versus six in 135, so a few less to go through. We do have a final project where you'll do a design and you'll do a bunch of renderings and a bunch of drawings related to that. We'll start that about 2 thirds of the way through the semester, and you'll, you'll work on it a lot in class, too. Uh, and that's worth 30% of your overall grade for the course. And then the last 10% is your participation. And that's made up of two components. And we'll talk more about those two components as we go forward in the slides. So your lab exercises. These are worth 20% of your overall grade, as I said. These are fundamentally a pass, not pass thing. You, you're here. You work on it. You did the work. You get 100%. You aren't here. You don't do the work. You didn't turn it in. You get a 0. Bookends. There's nothing in between. You either did it or you didn't. Very simple. The idea here is that this is where you experiment. This is where you learn. This is where you try things out. If it doesn't work, it didn't work. It's OK. You're learning. So I'm more interested in you going through the process and trying to really understand what I'm teaching you than for the end result to turn out beautiful. If it turns out beautiful, all the better. But if it didn't, that's OK. That's to be expected. So it's a pass, not pass thing. At the end of the day, which for you guys is going to be 2.15, you should be turning something in every class day. 
In rare instances, I'll have you go longer or it'll span two exercises or whatever. Sometimes at the end uh, of the semester when we start to get into the final project and you're working on something and it's not exactly what I was working on, you'll just turn something in. Uh, and we'll talk about that when it gets closer, just so you have a record of where you are and what you were working on. So essentially, as long as you were here, as long as you worked on it, and as long as you turned it in, you get 100%. That's great for your grade. It's a good thing. If you don't do it, you get a zero. Your assignments are larger and typically will require some work outside of class. The good news is if you get done with work in class, you can take that time and work on your assignment while you're, you're still here, and there'll be some time like that. Though this semester, because of the change in timing, um, there's not as much dedicated time to doing work in class. There's still a few days where I give you just time to catch up and, and whatever, but there's too much to cover in the amount of time. So you'll have to tack on little bits of work here and there. Um, and so I'll help you through that. They are collectively worth 40% of your overall grade. If there are four of them, that would mean each one is worth 10% of your overall grade. Easy math, right? They're graded both on the skills that you use and also the end result. How good did it turn out? So for example, in the beginning, were the first assignment, which you don't have the skills yet to do, but you're going to design a chair and a table. You're going to be graded on how did they turn out. Not necessarily how complicated they are, but how did they turn out? Are they well designed? Are they well built? Do you have good texture mapping? All of those kinds of things feed into, is this a good final rendering of this particular uh, assignment? And you'll, there's more specifics and we'll go through it. The point is that it's more than just, I was able to use all the skills that you told me. They should actually be well articulated and well done, not just, I was able to put a texture on the object. You may elect to improve your assignments by submitting one regrade for each assignment. This is the same as 135. For those of you that were on 135, same policy applies here. Essentially, you did your first assignment, you did your table and your chair, you didn't like your end grade. You can go back any time up until the last day of the semester and resubmit that assignment, change it, do it again. I will then pretend that your first one never happened. It's like just a redo. In that instance, your grade can go up and it can also go down. So if you do a worse job, it's going to go down. And I think that's fair. If I give you the opportunity to do a regrade and you do a terrible job on the regrade, there's no reason your grade shouldn't go down. The other thing about the regrades is that they occur at the very end of the semester. So you can post it whenever you want. You could do assignment uh, 101 and you could say, oh, I did terribly, or sorry, excuse me, assignment 201, oh, I did terribly on it, I'm, I'm going to redo it. I redid it the next weekend, I submitted it, I say, you know, assignment 201, regrade, and I turned it in. That's great, but I'm not going to look at it and regrade it until after the semester's over. So when you guys are done with your final, then I'll go back and do the regrades. So I don't do any regrades, so your grade stands until the last day of the semester. So that's kind of how the regrades work. If you struggle with it or you're confused about it, don't worry, we can talk through it uh, if you really want to do a regrade if and when that, that opportunity arises. You can do one for each of the assignments. So there's four assignments. You can do four regrades if you want to. You can't do two regrades on the same assignment, though. You only get one shot to do a regrade. Course participation. So after many of the exercises, though not very many in the beginning, because we're all just learning the basics. If I, if I made you do what, what you're going to do today, a little cube with a slanting side, it's kind of why write a comment on it? Because everybody did the exact same thing. I mean, what can you constructively say about the same shape that everybody did? So in the beginning, there won't be too many comments. As it goes forward in class, there will be comments. Um, this is part of your participation grade for the semester. Now, a lot of you that were in 135, you see that I bring up the comments again, and you go, oh, man, we're going to have to do that again, right? I know. I know that's how you respond to it. I have a reason for why I think the comments are important. And I'm going to reiterate it to you in 135 as well as to the new people in 136 because I do think they're really important, and I wouldn't just cut them out because you think they're annoying. And so these have two purposes. Number one, when you're working on a design, and let's fast forward a bit in this class toward uh, your design that's toward the end of the semester when you're working on your final project. It's not possible for me to come around and give every one of you individual critique on where you're going with your project and how it turns out. I can't do it. There's 30 of you and one of me. I, I would use all the time trying to do that in class. 
So by doing this comment system, assuming the comments are constructive, not great work, looks pretty, not those kinds of comments, but good constructive comments, hey, what, what do you think about moving the column grid slightly to the left because I think that would help? Or change the or angle of the rendering because you're not showing enough of this particular area and that's a really strong area of your building, or whatever, some kind of constructive comment. If you get those constructive comments, you're getting feedback on your work, which is really good. The second half of it, though, is besides getting feedback on your own work, is that you, as a young designer, have to learn how to articulate what's working and what's not working about someone else's work, and figure out how to tell them what's working and what's not working without sounding like a jerk. That's important. You guys, by this point in your architecture career, have all had a review where somebody's come in and given you some kind of feedback, correct? I would say most of you have been in that shoe. Chances are the person who gave you that review was really trying to help. It may have sounded mean at the time, but if you look back on it, you might say, you know what, that actually was kind of helpful. And it did give me some ideas that I hadn't thought about, especially if you keep your mind open when you're thinking about it. So it's really useful for you to flip the table, for you to have to figure out how to tell somebody else this is working or this isn't working and why. So that's, part, that's the other half of this and why I make you do it, because it teaches you how to talk about your ideas and how to think about somebody and how to help somebody else, which is really, really useful in a design field. So we're going to do this. Every one of the assignments, you have to have three. And every, a large number of the exercises you will, though in the beginning, you don't have very many. So we will do a comment next class altogether, even though it's of a cube and it's not really relevant. We will all do one together. And then you'll go on break for comments for several weeks. I will remind you when the comments have to happen. So it's, you won't be suddenly like, oh yeah, by the way, you should have commented on the last 20 exercises. No. I will tell you, hey, guess what? The comments need to happen. It'll be at the end of your exercises. You should comment on this exercise. It'll start to be rather obvious. But it won't happen for, for probably six weeks. Your, this is part of or half of your overall participation grade for the course. So it's 5% of your overall grade is this, the comments. The other part is being here and your attendance. We'll talk about that in a second. So in this class, you're required to have some kind of a flash drive or hard drive to do your work on. I would say minimum size is 32 gigs, though in all honesty, you could probably use some more space than that. There's a pretty hefty material library that you're going to need uh, as part of your renderings and part of V-Ray. And somehow, when you start to do this kind of work, you, your files can get rather large. They're complicated. Having an extra space is not a bad thing. A lot of you have moved from the flash drive into the hard drive category. It's really a personal preference. If you want to use a larger hard drive, that's fine. I have no problem with you doing either one. I would say 32 gigs is the minimum, the bare minimum, for this class. As if you're sharing your flash drive with another class, get some more space than that, um, because I think it's useful. You're going to want to safeguard your flash drive. So if you come to me and say, I washed my flash drive in my jean pocket when I went home, I'll say, yeah, that sucks. Or that's too bad. If you left your flash drive behind like two people did this morning already, first day, right? that's not a good sign, and you lose it, I'll say, sorry, bummer. It's not my problem to keep track of your flash drive. It's your problem to keep track of your flash drive and not lose it. If it helps to attach it to your keys, maybe attach it to your keys, because you're not going to go anywhere without your keys. Sometimes people, I used to do that, and then I realized that I have to unlock too many doors during the day, and it's too annoying. So um, it, it is what it is. You have to keep track of it. I will talk a little bit about backup, but not much in this class. If you already took 135, you heard my lecture about backup, in which case you really should back up your stuff. And if you didn't take 135 and have no idea what backup is, maybe watch that lecture from 135 so that you get, get thought, or you think about how you might back up your, your work. But again, it's not my problem to keep track of your work. People have lost their flash drives or have killed their flash drives in the week before finals. It's happened. Back up your stuff. Make sure you're OK. Uh, so safeguard it. You will need a few physical modeling tools for this class. Um, they're not particularly expensive. When we do the cardboard topo models, you'll have to go to the bookstore and buy some cardboard. Again, it's not super expensive. So I don't think you have to budget a huge amount for this particular class. Um, the, the 3D printing filaments and stuff are uh, 
paid for by the college, so you don't have to overly worry about that, which is fantastic. So that's good. Um, so really, the costs aren't too bad for this class, but I like to at least inform you that there are going to be a few ongoing costs. Though, if you can afford a cup of coffee, you can probably afford the, the, the costs of the class. So attendance. Attendance in this class is absolutely mandatory. You have to be here. If you're not here, you can't learn. Uh, I know that I post a lot of the videos online. That does not mean that you can skip coming to class. Uh, Rhino is very specific. You are going to need help on things that you do. I promise you that. Even if you think you really know Rhino, you're still going to need help. Uh, and so being here is absolutely critical. Um, next class, when you come in, that will be your seat for the rest of the semester. So figure out where you want to sit, get here early enough to get that seat, negotiate with your friends, bribe your friends, whatever it is to get the right seat, um, or just take potluck and that's fine too. It's not like there's a really bad seat in here. Um, that will then be your assigned seat for the rest of the semester. It helps me a lot because we don't have to waste time taking roll. I can do the roll afterward and I can really easily see, oh, that seat's empty, that seat's empty, I know who's gone. Makes, makes it a whole lot more efficient and that's what we're going to do. So roll is taken every day of class. When I take roll, I take it at a random time during the class, sometime between the start of class and the end of class. You don't know what that time's going to be, and that's to keep you honest. So you don't get to leave early, and you better be here on time. Does that make sense? So if you step out, I get it. You have to go to the bathroom. The other thing that I get, believe it or not, is that this class spans lunch. I get it. I'm hungry too. So if you feel like you really need to take a break, you really need to have some food, I totally understand. Go outside, sit on one of those benches, have your food, no worries. If I happen to take roll when you're sitting out there, assuming you're sitting out there, it's pretty easy to know that you're there. Furthermore, the truth is that I pretty much know who's here and who's not, regardless of when I take the roll. Um, so if for a weird outside reason, somehow I mismark you and you're actually here and you're not here, you'll come to me afterwards and say, I'm here, here's the work that I did, and I'll say, oh yeah, I remember helping you do that, or whatever. So it's never been a problem. I've done it for years this way. It seems to work out just fine. So that's how I do it. You can't leave class early either. And so this is an important one. I have to be a little bit more strict about this than I'd like to be. Uh, but that is, given the shorten, shortening of the semester, all the time that we have in here is really valuable time. So you can't afford to just waste it. If you, get, if you breeze through a particular exercise, we're not talking today, today's different. But if you breeze through another exercise and get done really quickly, that's great. A lot of you are in one of the higher level studios. How many people are in 220 this semester? Okay, so a large number of you. Guess what? You always have something to do. Right? You probably already have something to do and you don't realize you have something to do yet. So the point is that because you always have something to do and you're going to be needing to do something, why not spend that extra time in this class doing it? Furthermore, we don't have as much time during the day to catch up on other things or whatever for this class, so use the extra time for your assignments. Work on it. The advantage here is that if you have a question and you're working on your 220 model, I'm still here and you can still ask me. Now, I'll give priority to the people in the class that are actually asking questions about this class, but I'm still available for help, which is not a bad thing. So you're going to use all of that time. You're not going to leave work early. This part of your participation grade is 5%. It adds up into that 10%. So this is valuable as well. A couple other notes relating to your attendance. If you're not here for two weeks or more, you may be withdrawn from the class. Now, I'm not a big fan of withdrawing people. I don't like to withdraw people. I don't think I should have to withdraw people as much as we're in a place where there's lots of hand-holding. I don't agree with it. I would, in all honesty, I would rather have just give you an F. That would be my store, you know, choice in the matter. Um, the difference here is that you have the option to withdraw up until the 75% mark in the class. And I will send you an email saying, hey, it doesn't look too good uh, when we get closer to that if you're in that category. Hopefully none of you will be and we don't have to worry about it. But if you're in that category, I'll send you a little reminder email. But take responsibility for yourself. This is fundamentally a college class. You should want to be here. You should love the subject matter. This shouldn't be a chore. You should all be here because you want to be in the design field. So this should be fun. So if you're not doing well or you're not happy about it, take yourself out of it. Don't rely on somebody else to do it for you. It's important. That's part of being a grown up about it. Uh, if you haven't completed more of three assignments, <laughs> This is pretty obvious. You're probably going to fail the class. That's probably a bad sign, right? You might want to take yourself out of the class. 
that sort of thing. Um, I have to put these kinds of notes on there. Assignment due dates will be announced in class. Assignments are due at the start of the class on the day that they're due. That means before I start talking. So if this class starts, what time does this class start again? 11.10? I know, this schedule is messing me up. If this class starts at 11.10 and I start talking at 11.15, anything that's turned in after 11.15 would be marked late. So you'd lose one, one late day out of it. So it's when I start talking is the, is the time that, that it actually starts. So I recognize there's always a little flux in the very beginning of class. The truth is just post it earlier and then you don't have to worry about it, okay? Exercises are due at 2.15 on the day that they're um, assigned. So you guys will be working on an exercise today, a lab exercise. I'll give you that handout after uh, we take a quick break. You guys will work on that. It's due at 2.15. So you need to have posted it by 2.15. It shouldn't take longer than the amount of time that I'm giving you. So you should be able to finish this by 2.15. It's actually kind of humorous because this particular thing would probably take you 30 seconds at the end of the semester, maybe 15, and it's going to take you 40 or 45 minutes pretty easily today, all of you. So it's just entertaining. You'll get better, I promise. So um, anyway, it should be done at 2.15. Late work is marked down, or I might just give you zeros, et cetera. It is always possible to miss turning something in. And those of you that were in 135, I guarantee you you had this happen, or you just you missed something. You forgot to post it or whatever. It happens. I get it. You're human. I'm human. No big deal. Post it later. I'll give you credit for it. If it starts to become a habit where you like aren't turning in anything, that's where we get into problem territory. So just make sure you're turning it in and keeping up. Way better to keep up than to get behind. OK, so a couple additional guidelines for the class. Um, number one, I'm here. I'm trying my best to help you. There's 30 of you. There's one of me. It's really hard for me to help all of you all at the same time. I'll try my best, and those of you that have been in my classes know I try to get around to everybody and make sure everybody gets the help that they need. If you're struggling with something, ask your neighbors and see if they know how to do it. Look at the videos online, look at the tutorials, see if that can get you unstuck and keep going. The worst thing for you to do is sit there with your hand up all day waiting for somebody to show up and do nothing. That's not my goal. I want you to get through it. I'm working right now on getting a TA for the class. I had a TA last semester for the first time, and it was absolutely fantastic to have just somebody else to help me get through everybody when you had questions. So fingers crossed that I'll end up getting one this semester as well. As of right now, I don't officially have one, but I'm working on it. So that'll be good because it'll help you get, get forward uh, faster because there's more people to kind of help, help with those questions. Uh, I strongly suggest you bring the handbook because you can take notes and, and keep track of things. I've found also that people have success bringing a set of headphones to plug into the computer so that they can watch my videos and recordings. And um, in that context, they can watch a little bit, pause it, do some work, come back, watch a little bit more, pause it. And that seems to be helpful. I do post all of my um, lectures on, the, uh, on YouTube. Uh, my, I don't know if I, let me see if I have a slide for that. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead, but OK. I don't have a slide for it. Um, all of my uh, YouTubes are on, uh, it's youtube.com slash digital tools for arch. I'll write that down. Sorry, awful handwriting, right? Um, if, if I haven't cross-linked to the website, uh, if you go here, chances are you'll find the lecture. It goes there first, and then it gets cross-linked to the website. Um, all of the class stuff for this particular class, 136, starts in the 200s. So your exercises will be two, 201, 202, 203, et cetera. Lectures, 201, 202, 203. Assignments, 201, 202. You get the idea. So everything's in the 200s. It keeps it separate from the 135 so that you'll be able to see that. So it's youtube.com slash digital tools for arch is where I post all the lectures. Those are not a substitute for being in class. The good news is if you do happen to miss class, it's there so you can see what I missed uh, or what you missed. Um, but it's different. If you're in class, you can stop me. You can ask a question. You can say, wait, I didn't understand. Could you do it again? And if you're watching it online, you don't have that interaction. And so it's really important and critical to have that interaction. 
So the one other thing that I want to ask about, and I thought I had a slide about it, but maybe I missed it when I was going through, is that if you're not going to be here, you have to let me know that you're not going to be here. Okay? Let's say you all have a job. A lot of you have jobs right now anyway. If you just didn't show up for work one day, how would that go over? Not so well. Probably not so good, right? How about if you didn't show up two times and didn't tell anybody? You probably wouldn't have that job anymore, right? So I ask that you please text me, email me, tell me I'm not going to be in class. It's not too big of a thing to ask for. Just tell me that you're not going to be in class. That way I know you're not going to be here. You've given me notice. I'm not waiting to start lecture hoping that William's going to show up. Sorry, I'm not picking on you, but you know, I'm not doing that. And you're not going to show up anyway, or whatever. I know you're going to be here. That's why I picked on you, right? So if you tell me in advance, it's a whole lot easier for me to know, oh yeah, you're not going to be here. I can plan on that. So let me know. If you're going to be late, let me know. You can ask Siri to text me. That's fine. I give you my phone number. Just do it. OK. So please let me know if you're going to be late. The other thing is the late work policy. And I'm going to give you a hint right now. And this is a real hush-hush secret hint. It's far better to turn in something, even if it's really bad, than to turn in something late. So you always want to turn in something on time, because that's going to give you full credit. I mean, you might do terribly on it, but you can regrade and not have a late, late work uh, as, attached to it. If you turn it in late, it drops by 10% for every class day that it's late. So if we had something due today, you would have had to turn it in before the start of class today. If you didn't, if it was turned in at uh, you know, 11.20 today, that would be marked late. You'd lose 10%. If you had a 95, it just became an 85. If you do a regrade on that assignment, you don't get the late penalty back. The late penalty sticks from, from then forward. So you just don't want to be late. And the reason that I do this is that in your life, you can't afford to be late. Let's say you're, you're working in an architectural firm. You guys have a, a meeting scheduled where you have to go before a design review commission. They need to have your documents in so that you can be scheduled on the agenda and actually have your meeting happen. If you're late, if those are due at 4 o'clock and you turn them in at 4.10, they're going to say, too bad you can't be on the agenda. You have to have stuff on time. So just don't be late. It's really critical that you not be late. So anyway, that's how it works. If you don't turn in anything at all, no surprise, it's a zero. If you turn in something by the end of the semester, even if it's really late, I'll still give you half credit for it, because I'm such a nice guy, right? OK, so I think that gets through a lot of the stuff, the programmatic stuff. It's all in the syllabus. If you, if you need to go back and, and review anything, it's all in there. Uh, but I like to throw a bunch of slides out just so you can see some of the pictures of things related to what we're going to be working on and or building. So here's a bunch of student work from this particular semester or from previous semesters. A lot of these are the final renderings. Some of these are older final renderings. And I'll go through them rather quickly because we don't need to spend too much time uh, seeing them. Some of these have some collage work that's been done with them. Some have a little bit of Photoshop. I will touch on Photoshop a bit in this semester, but I can't spend too much time because we spend all of it in V-Ray um, and in Rhino. The truth is, if you have some Photoshop skills, you can get away with doing a little bit less in V-Ray and save yourself a little time. But this class is about Rhino and V-Ray. Therefore, you're going to learn Rhino and V-Ray. If you have some Photoshop, great. If not, we'll still get there in the end. That one, this one to me always looks like the floor is flooded. It's too reflective. Some of these are too dark. Apologize. It's always tough on a projector to, to see them all. OK, so we, it is 12, 12.01. Why don't we come back in 15 minutes or so? I'll give you your break now. And then when we come back, you'll have your first exercise to do, which is exercise 201. 
And we're actually going to do some Rhino today. And so we'll open up Rhino and we'll, we'll go through that. I will also make sure that those of you that haven't registered on the course website will actually do your registration today uh, as well. So we'll go from there. Come back in 15 minutes and we'll keep going. OK, so we're going to get uh, started back up again. Uh, for those of you that are already registered on the course website, obviously the first part is very redundant for you. Um, you don't have to create a separate registration. You can use your same account from last time. Uh, if you're in my morning section of 135 this morning, you can use the same account from that morning section. You don't have to do something separate. Um, so that's, that's not a problem. For those of you that have not taken any of my classes before and have never used this website, the first 10 minutes or so is going to be for you. The rest of you, you can kind of zone out for a little bit, and then we'll, we'll start with Rhino in, in just a second. But for those of you that haven't worked through uh, the course website, it is digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. It's this website here. If you go to digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, you'll get this page. Um, this is where all the stuff related to the class is going to be kept. So I don't use the Canvas system. Um, this is separate and apart from that. I pay for my own host, and my own servers, etc. So this is entirely separate from it, uh, which I think is better because I have a lot more control over it and it's a little bit prettier in the process. At least I hope it is. So in the About section here, it, you guys are always going to be looking for Archie 136 or the 200s series of numbers. And so, um, for example, if I went to About and then Digital Tools for Architects 136, I'd have the course syllabus, the course calendar, and all of the calendar feeds that you could subscribe to the calendar if you wanted to. Uh, that's there as well. Um, as we go forward a little bit, we would have our lectures. Again, you guys are looking for the Archie 136 category. Uh, fall of 2018 would take you to today's, or the start of this semester's lectures. Uh, the Lecture page would look like this. Thus far, we only have lecture 201. That's the one that I am in process giving to you right now. If you clicked on lecture 201, you would get a page that looks very much like this with that orange bar that goes across. That's because you're not logged in. And there's things that I don't allow just wide open access to. You have to be logged in to see. So I encourage you to all log in before you start going anywhere. Most of you already have login, so I'm not worried about it. If you don't have a login yet, this is where you're going to get your login. Uh, if you click the login button or click the, the button at the very end of the menu bar at the top of the page, you'll go to the login screen. This is what the login screen looks like. I have pre-opened all these tabs just in case the website's running slow so you don't have to sit around and wait for me to, to load these things. Um, this is where you'll go 99% of the time, but the first time ever you have to register. And register, there's a little register link at the very bottom of this login page. Right there, it says register. You'll click on that register link, and you'll get this page that says register for the site. You'll be picking a username and an email. Please make sure your username is somehow related to your actual name, because I have to be able to figure out who you are. And so if you pick some random username that I don't know who you are, that's a little challenging. So please, please, please pick something related to your name like G Adams or Grant.Adams or something like that. So it's really obvious for me. Then you'll put in your email. It does not have to be your school email. It doesn't have to be your insight or anything. Just an email address that you actually use would be nice. Uh, so a lot of you have put a Gmail address in there. And then under invitation code, it's written on both sides of the boards in all capital letters here and over there. You're going to use that as your invitation code. You'll type that in and that will allow you to actually click the register button without any errors. Once you've clicked on that register button, it will send you an email with a link to change your password. If for some reason you're not seeing that email, um, I know Gmail every once in a while will do this. Um, it may have gone into your spam folder, so you might have to find it in your spam folder. If that's the case, go into your spam folder, find it, click on the link, and you can then change your password. I'm going to pause for just a second. I'm going to walk around to those of you that have not done this before and make sure that you're registered. Uh, the other thing that you can do, chances are the people sitting next to you probably have already registered. So if you're having trouble, ask them uh, and make sure because there's such a number of you that have already taken a class with me before. But I want to make sure all of you are registered so that you can download the file that we're going to need next. Okay, so I'm going to pause. I'll come around, make sure everybody's registered, and then we'll, we'll actually start with some Rhino. Okay, so I think I've got everybody uh, registered and logged in. That's good. We'll talk about making the post. For those of you that have never done a post, we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
uh, in the class. But we're going to actually start by doing something in Rhino today. I want you to get your feet wet and uh, do a little experimentation in Rhino. Like I said earlier, what you're going to do probably will take you 40 minutes to an hour today. It will probably take you 15 seconds by the end of the semester. Like it's a very fast sort of thing. But this is how you have to get used to Rhino and familiar with it, um, et cetera. How many people have ever worked in AutoCAD? Okay, so that's a good sign. If you've worked in AutoCAD before, Rhino is fairly easy to adapt to. Um, there's a lot of commands that are si similar. If you have worked in a command line environment like AutoCAD using Rhino, which is a command line environment, is a very intuitive sort of switchover. So I think that's good. Um, Rhino to me is one of the absolute best 3D modeling programs available. It gives you huge flexibility. You can make almost anything out of it. And you have a lot of very powerful tools that are built into it that we'll use a lot in this class that other 3D modeling programs just don't have. Uh, my hope is that you'll take this class and you'll never look at SketchUp the same. Let's put it that way. OK? So um, for, for moving forward, I'm going to ask you guys to, on the website, once you're logged in, go to Exercises, go to R136, click on Fall of 2018, and then click on Exercise 201. And when you, when you get to Exercise 201 here, um, as you scroll down, under Part 2, the first line item here is Exercise 201.3dm. And I want you to right click on it. And I want you to click on Save Link As. And it should show it as uh, file name, Exercise 201, Save As Type, Rhino 3D Model. That should be what it says. It's not always the same. And depending on what browser you use, it might be slightly different. But there it is. And I'll go ahead, because not all of you have flash drives or whatever, if you have a flash drive and you want to save it there, that's fine. Today, I'm just going to save it to the desktop. And I'll click on Desktop. It's Exercise 201. And then I'll go ahead and click on Save. There it is. You could create a brand new Rhino file um, from scratch. The difference here is I've already baked in a few materials for rendering later on. So I'm trying to get things ready for you. If you do it from a fresh Rhino file, it's not the end of the world. So now that I have that already saved, I'm going to go ahead and minimize it. I should see my Exercise 201 down here on the desktop. Uh, and I can double click to open it. So I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, we want to use Rhino 64-bit. Why there's a Rhino 5 that's not 64-bit, I don't know. But we want to use the 64-bit version of it. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And it'll start to open. For those of you that were here last semester, this computer looks very different. We have this really wonderful sunset background. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a very interesting organization of our um, stuff on our desktop. That essentially translates to this being a brand new image, which probably means that 90% of what we're going to try to do won't work right away because it's a brand new image. So we're just going to work through it, and there are some problems. I already uh, did this a few times, and I already discovered some of the problems. One of the problems when I first opened Rhino is the fact that there isn't a toolbar on this side like there should be. How wonderful, right? So now that this is open, I'm going to go ahead and close it and open it again. And that should fix the problem, fingers crossed. There we go. So why that does that, I have no idea. But this is the nature of the issues. The other, the other thing that happened is the V-Ray toolbar that I asked to be loaded didn't load either. So we're going to have to go through that. We'll cover that more next class. So now that I have this open, I'm going to go ahead and expand uh, Rhino to see the full size of the page. Yeah? There's something about firewalls. If you see something about firewalls, click Cancel or click Continue or whatever. If it asks you for a password, you don't have an admin password, so there's nothing you can do about it. So just click Cancel and move on. But like I said, you might have to open Rhino, and then close Rhino, and then open Rhino again. I don't know. It's a new image. I try. So once Rhino is open, like it is right here, we're going to go ahead and talk through kind of what's happening in Rhino so that you get used to the general structure uh, of what's going on in a Rhino window. So first off, at the top of the page, we have our traditional uh, menu structure, you know, file, edit, view, et cetera. 
almost all the commands that we're going to use are available under these menu structures. So if, for example, we wanted to move something, we could go to transform and then choose move. So they are all available there. That's not necessarily the most efficient way of accessing tools, but they are available under the menu structure. Below these menu items is something called the command line. And you can see it here. It's got a bold command with a flashing cursor. This, much like AutoCAD, allows for keyboard input. So if I wanted to move something, for example, I could type move as a command and hit enter, and that would initiate the move command. The same as going to transform and then move. And I'm just picking move as an arbitrary example. The one nice thing that happens in Rhino is as you start to type a command, so if I typed M, I'd get all the commands with M. As I say M-O, it shortens the list. M-O-V, I get a shorter list. And before you know it, it has what I'm thinking. So as I start to type, it's showing me uh, what my options are. The more efficient you are at modeling in Rhino, the more you will use the command line. It's the same in AutoCAD. The more you use that command line, the more efficient you'll be, the faster you can work, etc. So as you start to learn those commands, it'll make it a little bit easier for you. If you don't know any of the commands to start, that's perfectly OK. We can do it by picking buttons or using the menu structure. When I'm lecturing about this stuff, I will go back and forth. I will constantly be changing. Sometimes I'll go to the menu structure. Sometimes I'll type it. Sometimes I'll click the button. And I'll try to show you that there are multiple ways of doing the same command. It's always hard, though, when I'm doing this kind of a lecture, for you to necessarily know what I'm doing. Like if I type move and you didn't see me type move, well, wait, how did he get to move? So I'm going to try to verbally explain it. When I do the recordings, I try to keystroke log so that you'll see some of the keystrokes. Unfortunately, the Windows version of the keystroke logging is not as good as the Mac version, so it doesn't log all the keys. Like if I type move, it might miss a few of the letters, which is really annoying, but it's what I'm with. So um, below the command line, we have a series of ribbons or tabs, depending on how you want to, to work with it. Uh, we have a new in version 5 tab open. Really, in all likelihood, we're just going to want to work with the standard tab. So I would click on this first tab option here for standard. That gets us back to the standard tool set. That's the bulk of what we're going to be using, um, though a few of the other tubes can be relevant, or a few of the other tabs or ribbons can be relevant later on. I'm going to start with the standard tab. These are a variety of the standard buttons that we might be working with going forward. Likewise, this toolbar on the left-hand side here gives us access to a large number of the tools that we would use on a regular basis. One thing to point out with these tools is that many of them have a little arrow in the bottom right corner of the tool. That usually means that there's a bunch of other tools related to the first tool hidden underneath. So here under the Surface tool, if I click that little triangle, I get a little pop-up win window with a bunch of other Surface type tools available. So sometimes you actually hear in the primitive solids here, you can see, oh, there's a cue, there's a cylinder, there's a sphere. I've got a bunch of different options. Uh, that are hidden underneath. So most of these tools have those options hidden underneath them. Um, and so it's important to be aware of. Generally, if you, if you mouse over any particular object, it'll give you a little yellow information about what this tool is. So just be aware that that's, that's there for you as well. In the workspace itself, right now we have four views set up. This is much like your, what, Architecture 130 class, where you had a top a front and a right side with the addition of a perspective view or a 3D view as your fourth view. For some people, they like to work with all of these views at the same time. In some cases, it's useful to have all of the, the views open at the same time. For our purposes today, we're only going to be working in the perspective view. I can click where it says perspective here. And when I click on that, you see that it kind of highlights in blue. There it is highlighted in blue. If I double click on it, it then makes that window the full size. It gives me more working space. I can double click on it again, and it goes back to the four views. So you can get into one big view, and you can get out of one big view, which is very, very useful um, as you work. Because sometimes you will do some work in the top view. Sometimes you will do the work in the right side view. It's going to vary um, depending on what it is that you're trying to model. So I've gone ahead and I've made the perspective view the big view. On the right side over here, this first tab in these windows is our properties view. This is telling us general information about the object or the view, et cetera. 
And so right now it's giving us information about the viewport because there's no object that's selected, which is fine. And we'll talk about what all this stuff means. I like to give you kind of an overview first of what's happening uh, in this program. The next little um, window over, the next little tab, is your layers. It looks like a red, white, and blue piece of pie. Uh, those are your layers. Right now we have a default layer, and I have a scene layer that is locked. We'll talk about layers more next class. Um, it's enough to know that we're going to be working on the default layer. That's fine. We'll get to more complicated layers as we go forward. There is also some other things like a display window, and there's a help window. If you get stuck and you want to work through the Rhino help, it's there as well. I'm going to stick with just the properties view for right now. At the bottom of our Rhino window, at the bottom down here, uh, we have tabs that represent our various views. Should we want to go to a various view? Uh, if I wanted to switch from perspective to the front view as a large view, I could do it that way. Or I could double click, get the four views, and then double click again. I don't think in all of my years of actually working in Rhino, I've ever used those tabs. It is what it is. Below that, um, at the very bottom, we have something called C-plane. We have an X, Y, and a Z. As I move my mouse around, you see those numbers change. That's telling me where in space my mouse actually is. And we'll talk more about that in the coordinate system that is behind uh, Rhino next class. So don't worry about that too much for right now. We also have right here something that says inches. And hopefully on yours, it says inches. If you didn't download my file and open my file, it may say millimeters instead of inches. These are your units that you're going to be working in. For our purposes in this class, we will always be working in inches. Um, in rare cases, if you feel more comfortable in the metric system and would rather work on that, I'm OK with it. The problem is it messes with all the materials. Um, so it's best to work in inches. The nice thing about Rhino is if you work in inches and you suddenly decide you want to type in a foot value, oh, I want this line to be 20 feet, that's perfectly OK. You just add an apostrophe after your, your number, and it'll, it'll think of it as feet. Um, so that's fine. So it should say inches. If it does not say inches, you'll right click on it, go to unit settings, and you'll change your model units from whatever it is to inches. My guess is that yours all say inches, so I'm not too worried about it, but I'm trying to show you that ahead of time. As we move over further, it shows us what our current layer is, which is default. And then we have grid snap, ortho, planar, o snap, smart tracking, gumball, etc. All of those options are great and very important, but not relevant for what we're doing right now. So I'm not going to worry about it for right now, but we'll come back and talk about those options as they become relevant. OK, so that's kind of the general overview of what's happening inside of Rhino. We're then going to start on the Rhino Tutorial 5.2, which is available on the course website. And here it is, Rhino 5.2. There's a link to it. I could right click and say open a new tab. And here it is. I also printed it out on the back of this sheet. So you could go through this. We're going to create a simple shape in Rhino. And one of the things that's hard uh, when I do these in, in lecture format is I don't always do it exactly the same way I wrote the tutorial. Sometimes I switch the order. So I'm going to try to follow my, my own tutorial. Um, but there's a lot of different ways of making this particular shape. There's a lot of commands that overlap. Uh, and so that varies a little bit as we go forward. This is what we're loosely going to follow as we go forward. So we've already have Rhino open, so I'm going to skip on, um, let me flip this over, hold on. I'm going to skip through the first two steps, and we're going to start with step three. And I'm going to work in the perspective view, which is my current view, and I'm going to start at the origin, which is right here where those two uh, pieces cross. Though. Um, you really could start somewhere else, it would be OK. And I'm going to draw a 5 foot by 5 foot rectangle using the rectangle corner to corner tool, which I show you what the tool looks like there in that little icon. It's also available right here. There's my rectangle corner to corner tool. So I will click on that corner to corner. And I said I wanted it to be 5 feet by 5 feet. If I want to start, Right there at the origin, notice I gave you the origin is 0, 0, 0. It's asking me for the first corner of the rectangle. I can just type in 0, 0, 0 and hit Enter. Alternatively, I could just click somewhere on the screen. And we'll talk through that in just a second. By the way, what I'm doing today, I'm going to repeat like three times. So if you get lost on a step, it's OK. Just wait for the next round, and I'll go through it again. Yeah. Uh, 
It's dead again. What do you mean? It froze. It froze. Everybody's froze. How many people's computer froze? Restart the whole computer. Restart Rhino. Huh. I know 27's been having problems. All right. Um, let me pause for a second and come around, and then we'll continue. Okay, so I'm going to keep going on the first round just so that I can get the people that are, that are in process going. Those of you that are, that are hung up, don't worry. We'll get you through today um, somehow. Okay, so I'm going to continue on, and I'm going to do that rectangle at 5 feet by 5 feet. So the command line here is asking me for the other corner or length. So the other corner, I can type in, um, and I really wasn't going to try to do this using the type ins, but I will uh, for this round. I'm going to put the at sign, like the email at sign, and I'll type 5 apostrophe comma 5 apostrophe, and I'll hit enter. So this was, let me write it on the board. I'll write it over here. More space. At 5 feet comma and I'll explain what all of those mean in just a second. And then I'll hit enter. And there it is. That's my little rectangle. Oh, a couple other things I should have pointed out. Uh, number one, if you want to orbit around a particular object, you just right click and hold and it lets you orbit around your object. To zoom in and zoom out, you can just use the scroll wheel. It centers on where your mouse is. So if I zoom out to one side and zoom in over here, or I'll zoom in over here, depending on where your mouse is, it'll zoom in to that particular place. So I have that. Now that I have that rectangle, I'm going to use the patch tool to fill in that rectangle with a surface. Because right now, it's just a line. That's all it is. So I need to make it an actual surface, and I'll use the patch tool. I have a variety of options for the patch tool. I can move into my surfaces and find the t patch tool, which of course I don't remember where it is because I never do it from the toolbars. Or I could go up to the surface menu and choose patch right there. Or I could type in patch either way. When I do that, it's going to be give me the patch surface options. And all of these defaults are just fine. We can go with it. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And it gives me a surface. These grid lines on the surface don't mean anything. They're just showing you that the surface is there. Uh, look at your command lines. Probably asking you to select the curve. Click the curve. The rectangle. Yeah, that, the line. And then hit Enter. There it gives you the pop-up. So if you get stuck on anything, always go back and check what your command line says, because it's probably prompting you for something. Find you know, what's your curve, that sort of thing. So I've gone ahead and I've added that surface on. That's good. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use that rectangular plane corner to corner to create one side of a cube. So once again, I'll go back to that rectangular plane corner to corner. But if I just went from here and started to draw, so let's say I started to draw again, and I, I were drawing, it's flat. It's on the ground. I want it to go up vertically. So instead, once I click rectangular plane corner to corner, I'm looking at some options that are here. One of the options is vertical. So I want it to come up instead of being flat. So I'm going to click on that vertical. Notice also that vertical, there's an underline under V, and it's capitalized. That V means that I could type V followed by enter for vertical. This is trying to help you out a little bit. Or you can just click on vertical. Now it's asking me for the start of edge, which is going to be along this back line. So as much as I might try to get right on that end point, without some kind of a snap like AutoCAD, I'm not going to get right to that end point. So I'm going to turn on my object snap, which is right here. I used to have this already on by default, but that was the old image, so it's not. So I'm going to click on O snap, and I'm going to check the box for end and for mid, 
And personally, I like to have perp on as well. Those are just my preferences. You, at least for this exercise, will need end and mid turned on. I know it's really hard to see because my head blocks it. Okay? But it's end and mid. And perp is always nice. And the o, o snap now is, is bold, meaning it's on at the very bottom. OK, so now as I move over my object, you see that it really conveniently snaps right to the end, and it says end. I can click there. End of edge would be the other end right there. I'll click. And now my rectangle, instead of going in the flat direction, is going up vertically. So now it's just a matter of typing the height. So it's asking for the height. This is going to be 5 feet. I'll put 5 apostrophe, and then go ahead and hit Enter. And there it is. Now, it's asking me one more thing, and that is, which one do I want? Because technically, it could be going up, or it could be going down. In my case, I want it to be going up. And all you have to do is click on the side that you want it to be on. So I want it on the upside. I'll just click somewhere on the upside. And it'll go pointing up. And again, like I said, I'm going to repeat this many, many times. So if you get a little bit lost, don't worry about it. Um, we'll keep going. So I've done that, and I've created that vertical um, line. Perfect. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and patch that. So I have the line, and I'm going to go back to my surface and then patch. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And that gives me a surface on the back, there and there. So I have those two pieces of it so far. So I'm going to do this whole thing again on one more side. So again, this is all about repetition. So I'll go back to my rectangle tool. I'll choose vertical. It's asking me for the start of the edge. I'll choose this edge here. The end of the edge, I'll choose right there. My height will be 5 feet. I'll hit Enter. I'll choose that I want it facing up instead of down. I'll select that rectangle. And so this brings up one other thing that Rhino does. Sometimes this is the easiest way. I have, if I were to click on this, there's two things that I could potentially be trying to click on in this space. One is the line itself, and the other is the surface behind the line. Rhino brings up the selection menu that allows you to toggle between the various things that are on top of each other which is really, really convenient. At first, it's annoying, because you don't understand why it like, keeps popping this up. But when you're working on a big, complicated 3D model, say your final project, and you have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of objects, and you're trying to click on one specific thing, and it thinks you want something else, it's really annoying. But if you get this pop-up, you say, oh no, I wanted this particular piece. So in this case, it's asking me, did I want the curve, or did I want the surface? I want the curve. And then I can go back up to Surface and then Patch and say OK. And now I get this side. So at this point, I have three surfaces, there, there, and there, that represents three sides of this cube. I'm going to right click, hold, and orbit so that I can see this in a little bit different context, like that. And I'm going to continue working on. And like I said, if you get lost along the way, it's OK. I'm just going to keep going all the way through, and then I'm going to start the whole thing again. That's OK. I'm going to do it at least three times over the course of what we're doing today. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a measure. Yep, I'm going to use the polyline tool to draw a line from this corner here to that corner there. So the polyline tool is right here. It's right below the white arrow. I'll click on the polyline tool, and I'm going to start on that corner, and I'm going to go across to that corner there. The polyline assumes that you want to keep drawing and keep going. To end the polyline tool, you just press the Enter key like that. Otherwise, you could keep going. I'm going to use a different command this time. And I'm gonna, going to, instead of patching, I'm going to use the surface from three or four corner points. It is this tool right here. It looks like kind of a 
polygonal surface with four dots on each side. If I click on that surface from three or four corner points, all I have to do is pick the corners. So I'll say I want this corner, that corner, and that corner. It's asking me for a fourth corner. I don't want a fourth corner, so I'll hit Enter to finish. And it fills in the top surface for me. Again, the lines on the top of the surface like that don't mean anything. It's OK that they're there. They're going to go away when we render. So if I orbit around, we can kind of see, oh yeah, I have two back sides. I have a little diagonal top, and I have a bottom. OK, that seems pretty good. So the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm now down to step nine as part of this. I'm going to use a command to duplicate an edge. And this one, a lot of you are going to say, well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't you just draw a line? Which I very easily could just draw a line. But I think this is a good point to introduce the concept that is different than things like SketchUp. And that is that in Rhino, you can generate what's called derivative geometry. So you have some object you can create new objects based on that existing object. So in this scenario, I have this surface. I can create a new line on the edge of that surface. And here, it's just a straight line. It's not a big deal. I could go up to my polyline tool, and I could draw a straight line from there to there. But imagine for a second that it wasn't a flat, straight surface. Let's say it was a piece of terrain with a bunch of ups and downs. It had a squiggle in it. It would be really hard to go in and trace that line. But in Rhino, we can say, no, just give me the edge. And it'll follow right along with all the curves and give me a line right on the edge to work from. All built into one command. So that, in a nutshell, is called derivative geometry. If you have two surfaces that intersect, even if they're complicated, undulating, weird surfaces, you could say, give me the intersection line. And it'll give us the line right along the intersection. So it's deriving a new geometry from an existing geometry. So I like to introduce that as a concept because it's something that we'll use frequently in this class. So even though it's early on, this is the first day you've ever worked in Rhino, I throw this at you just so you're aware it exists. Could you get away with just drawing a line and still end up with the same result today? Absolutely. But I like to give it to you as an option. So to get there, we're going to go up to the curve. Let me, hold on, let me deselect so nothing's selected. I'm going to go up to the curve menu. I'm going to say curve, curve from objects. Uh, if I can feed, there it is at the bottom. Duplicate edge is what I want to do. The other option would be to type in dupe edge. And I'll do that on the next one where I type it in. So it's going to say select edges to duplicate. All I have to do is pick that edge right there. And it highlights in yellow. There's my edge. When I'm done, I'll hit Enter. And it then creates a line right on the edge of my drawing. So now I have that line. And I also have a line that I created earlier right there. So I have those two lines to work with. So from here, uh, let me just make sure I'm going in the same order. I'm going to select this line that I just created right there. And I'm going to select this diagonal line. Now in order to select them both, I need to hold down the Shift key. So I'll hold down the Shift key on the keyboard. And I'll select that diagonal line right there. So I have those two lines selected, this one and that one. With both of those lines selected, I'm going to go up to the Surface menu. And I'm going to choose Loft. The other option would be to type in Loft. I want to point out one thing on the, uh, on the handout. Many times when there's a key command where you type it in, I'll put that command in bold in like a typewriter font so you know that I'm typing it in. So you saw under step nine there that dupe edge was kind of in that typewriter font. That means that you can type it in as a command. So I always try to make sure that I identify where you can type things in. Anyway, so I'm going to choose loft from the surface menu. And it's going to build a curving surface from this point, from this line to that line right there. I'll say OK. And you can, say that I, you can see that I've created that kind of twisting surface right there. Now that I've created that twisting surface, I just have to fill in this last piece, this last little triangle there. I could do that the same way that I did the top, which is a surface from three or four corner points. And I could choose 
one, two, and three. I'm done, I'll hit enter, and that then makes that surface. So I've now created a completely s contained object that looks something like the thing on the bottom of your handout. So like I said, I'm going to go through it again so you can see me do the whole thing again if you got lost on a particular step. Amanda, do you have a question? OK, well, I'll come back and we'll, we'll double check what happened. OK, so I'm going to build another one of these next to it. If you were successful at this first opportunity, great. I would still recommend doing it again. It can't hurt for practice to do this multiple times. So I'm going to do the same set of steps in the same order so that you guys can watch me through it. So this time, I'm going to start again with the rectangle corner to corner. There it is. I already did one right there, so I don't want to do it on top of itself. So I'll just click over here somewhere to start. And I wanted this rectangle to be 5 feet by 5 feet. That's where I'm going to use that at sign 5 feet, 5 apostrophe, comma, 5 apostrophe. So I'll say at and then 5 apostrophe, comma, 5 apostrophe, like that. So it should say at 5 apostrophe, comma, a 5 apostrophe, and I'll hit enter. So there's my 5 feet by 5 feet. I now have just the bottom, and it's just a curve that goes around the outside. Uh, Rhino uses the term curve to describe any line. And so it doesn't have to be straight. It can be curving. It can be whatever. But it, it, it uses the term curve to describe any form of line, polyline, etc. So that's a kind of a loose term. Once I have that, I'll select it. It's highlighted there in yellow as a selection. I'll go up to my surface menu and choose patch. Alternatively, I could actually just type in patch into the command line and hit Enter. When I do that, I get the patch surface options. The default options are just fine. I can go ahead and say OK. And it fills in so that I have a little surface there. The next thing that I'm going to do is to create that vertical rectangle along the back side. I'll go back to my rectangle tool. It's going to ask me for the first corner of rectangle, or I can choose that I want this to be vertical. So I'll pick vertical, or type V for vertical, followed by Enter. The start of my edge is going to be right there. The end of my edge is going to be right there. And I need to know what my height is. So I'll type in my height of 5 feet, so 5 apostrophe, and I'll go ahead and hit Enter. Now, we've been using 5 apostrophe for 5 feet. If I, my units are in inches, so I could do 60 inches, and it would be the same height, because 60 inches, or 5 times 12, is 60. So I could type in inches instead. So for example, I could type in 60. If I hit Enter, it would assume that I meant inches, because that's my default unit. I could also put the quotation mark after it to represent inches. Either way is just fine. And I'll hit Enter. It's going to ask me which one, the downward facing or the upward facing. I want the upward facing, so I'll go ahead and click. And there it is. At that point, I can go ahead and patch this rectangle. So I'll select it. I'll go up to my surface and then patch. And I can say OK. And that creates that surface there. Again, these, these diagonals this time are slightly off. I'm not worried about it. It's going to render out just fine. We'll talk about what those mean later on in the semester. For, for today's purposes, they're irrelevant. So I need another one along this edge. So once again, I'll go back to my rectangle. And I'll go to vertical. My edge will be from here to right there. And we'll come up to the top. There's my curve. And I'll go back one more time to surface and then patch. And I'll say OK. And there it is. This is how I've, I've written it out how to do it. In Rhino, there's always multiple ways of doing the same thing. So I could very easily have used a different tool. Underneath the surface tool here, there's a vertical plane tool. Instead of doing the rectangle and then patching it, I could do the vertical plane. 
It's just asking me for the edge. It's skipping a step. Since this is your first day, I'm trying to expose you to a variety of, 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 to, of different skills, like the difference between a curve and a surface. Therefore, I'm, I'm leaving it that way. OK, so I have that. Next thing was the diagonal across the top. I'm going to use my polyline tool right there to draw a diagonal from that corner to that corner. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and press Enter. There it is. So I have that line. I need another line at the bottom right here to right here. And I'm going to use that derivative geometry thing that I was talking about. So I'm going to do a duplicate edge. I can do that by typing dupe edge. Or I could go up to surface, or excuse me, curve, curve from objects, duplicate edge. Select edges to duplicate. It would be that edge right there. I can go ahead and hit Enter. It creates that line right there. I'm going to select this line and this line. And I'll do that by holding down the Shift key. There it is. So that one and that one. I'll go up to Surface and then Loft. Or I could type Loft into the, the commands. And now I end up with that curving, twisting surface on the front. I have two triangles to fill in. I'll do that using the uh, surface from three or four corner points. And I'll go one, two, and three. I'll go ahead and hit Enter. There's my first one. I'll go back to the surface from three or four corner points. And I'll choose one, two, and three and go ahead and hit Enter. And once again, I've created the second shape. And it looks like a lot of you have been able to follow along pretty easily. So that's good. That's a good sign. So at this point, I'm going to take a quick break from the instruction. I'm going to walk around and help people get to this point. And then we'll go through a few of the rendering options for the end. And you'll be able to, to, to post it. If you feel like you, you got far enough at this point and you feel comfortable with what we just did, go ahead and play around. Create some other shapes. See how, it, how, how intuitive it feels and that sort of thing. You're not going to hurt anything. You have the part that we're going to turn in for today. So experimenting a little bit, doing this again, is not a bad thing. Okay. So I'll pause. I'll come around and make sure people are, are doing OK. For those of you whose computers have crashed, hopefully you've restarted it and, and maybe by chance it works. If not, there's two machines on this side that you can switch to to use, at least for today. I will again submit that support ticket to see if we can't uh, get those fixed. Um, but walk around and see if there's an extra computer that's empty. I know 27 is, is in the same boat as you guys. If there aren't enough computers, don't worry. We'll get you on a computer by the end. A lot of people are almost done anyway. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure you get it, get it today. Okay. So I'll pause. I'll come around and help. And then we'll come back to do the rendering part in just a second. OK, so most of you uh, have the shape by now. So I'm going to walk you through the rest of, uh, of this. And I want you to feel free to play around with it and make more shapes and that sort of thing. If you finish before the end today, as long as you've made your post, which I will help you with if you haven't taken a 135 or 136, it's OK for you guys to leave early today. Um, next class, we'll, we'll revisit a bunch of these concepts. And we'll start back a bit in the basic level and make sure everybody gets really comfortable with the basics. Mm -hmm. So from here on out, now that I have my shapes, I'm going to talk a little bit about rendering and how the rendering works. And this is really the kind of thing where it's just the reward. It's the, you know, it's the cherry on the top kind of thing. If it doesn't work and we do a screen capture, that's fine. I just want you to make a post for today. We're going to cover all of this stuff in enormous depth going forward in the semester. Um, if right now, if you open my sample exercise 201 file, at the top here, if you were to just click on this blue ball, it would do a rendering for you. And you get two shapes that would show up. Those shapes are red because that's the default material I assigned to the layer that you were working on. So I did a bunch of stuff in the background to make this happen. Furthermore, I put in a little bit of lighting. And I put in a plane at the bottom so that you'd get that reflection. It's not on black. So there's a few things that I did to make this look a little bit nicer. Um, but we'll cover what all of those are later on. You just didn't. It's too many options for today, too much to deal with. The one thing that I do want to show you, however, is that we can change the material. I'm going to do that by going up to the V-Ray menu at the very top. 
and I'm going to go to the material editor. When I choose that, you'll see that this little pop-up here called V-Ray Material Editor will show up. I have a variety of scene materials preloaded for you. I have gold, which if you click on any of these, you'll see the actual material. I have gold. I have red plastic, which is what you rendered earlier. I have a, an orange that's a porcelain, so kind of a shiny orange. I have a shiny blue. I have a titanium or a metal. And I have wax, which is also kind of a weird material. So I picked a few random materials to let you guys have some options with these materials. If you want to change the material of your, um, of, of your cubes that you created, all you have to do is right click on this material. So in this case, I want to change to gold. I'm going to right click on the material, and I'm going to say apply material to layer, second option from the bottom, and I'll choose default because that's the layer I was working on. That's all I'm going to do to change the material today. I'll say OK. And now if I went back to that blue and rendered again, instead of being red, they'd be gold, and I'd be rich if I had them. <laughs> so you can play around with those. I threw those options in for you. Um, there are tons and tons of materials that we're going to be playing around with. There's concrete, there's woods, there's brick, there's everything you can think of has materials. Um, I picked some very simple ones today that I knew could be baked into your file so that they would be preloaded and you could be successful. If you turn in a copy of the red one, that's fine. If you turn in a copy of one with a different material on it, that's fine. If you turn in a screen capture, that's also fine. When we talk about the renderings, what you see on the screen is roughly what you're going to get. So this is what I see on the screen. When I render, I get an image that's roughly the same. If I were to zoom in a little bit more on one of these objects, like that, say, and I were to render, I'd get that. So however zoomed you are is a lot about how what the, your final rendering is going to turn out. If you lose a little bit because it's clipped off on one side, no big deal. Once you have your final rendering, we're going to click on this Save button. It's a disk. Now, not that anybody in this room has ever even used one of these, because you're not as ancient as me. Well, a few of, few of you are saying one time, right? Dad. Yeah, <laughs> you're dead. I remember using the big disks. That's how ancient I am, right? When they were really the floppy disks. Anyway, um, it's kind of funny that that symbol is still symbolic of Save, though, yeah. because nobody even knows what that means anymore. <laughs> so you're going to click on that disk to save it. And for our purposes today, you could save it to the desktop. That's fine. So I might say this is exercise. I can't type today, apparently. There we go. Exercise 201. There we go. It's going to save as a JPEG image file. So all I have to do is click Save. It's saving as that JPEG image. That's perfect. That is the only piece that I'm going to end up turning in today. That's the only post I'm making. If you have never been in one of my classes before and haven't done a post, I'm going to walk you through right now how to create a post. If it seems daunting at first, I promise you in a week it will not be hard. Furthermore, there's enough people that have been in my classes before that are probably sitting next to you that can do this with their eyes closed because it's that easy. So you can ask one of them and they can walk you through it. Yeah. You're what? You don't have V-Ray? OK. Well, I'll come and help you. I'll come and help you. It's probably that you're not in the 64-bit version of Rhino. Don't ask. But we'll, we'll solve it. OK, I'll come over in a second. OK, so I'm going to go to the course website, which we were all logged in on earlier. And if you're logged in, you'll see this black bar that runs across the top of the page. To turn in any assignment or exercise, you're going to click on the New button and you're going to select Post from that black bar. So I'll go to New and then Post. And in this class, it's really easy. Basically, you're always going to put a title in and you're going to put an image in. There's very little else that I'll ever ask you to do. So in our case, we're going to enter the title. This was Exercise 201. I'll put my name too. Then I need to upload the image. If I scroll down on the right side all the way to the very bottom, I'll see something for Set Featured Image. I'm going to click on that link for Set Featured Image. And it will take me to where I can upload my file. So I'll click on Upload Files. 
I'll click on select files and there was my image it's on the desktop I'll say open it will upload that file to the website there it is and I can choose to set featured image and you'll see a little preview here in a second where it'll show up there it is so I have my featured image set it won't actually let you publish your post without setting a featured image so you'll you'll have to set the featured image there's my featured image I'm gonna scroll all the way back up to the top there's one last thing to do under the categories section on the right side we're going to be looking out down here for exercise 201. That's what you just did. That has to be checked. It would be nice if we checked the general exercises tab as well. Not necessary, but nice. And it should be exercise 201. That should be checked. Once that's done, all you have to do is click the blue publish button, and that's effectively like handing me a piece of paper and turning it in. If you made a mistake after you do it, you can go back and make an edit, and I'll show you how to do that as we go forward, but I don't want to overwhelm you with too much today but it is, it is possible to make edits. I'm going to go ahead and click that publish sign, which is effectively turning it in. You will see here that it says post published. I can click on view post, and there it is. If that seemed a little challenging and you haven't done it before, I'll walk you through it and make sure that you are comfortable getting it done today. But I wanted to at least go through the whole thing. At this point, I'm going to walk around and help anybody individually that needs their help. A lot of you are already basically done, in which case I'll see you on Wednesday. Please make sure you bring your flash drive or hard drive or whatever it is you plan to store your information on on Wednesday because we'll actually start storing stuff that matters on Wednesday. So start to be ready for that. Uh, Wednesday is a normal class day. We will have it as if you're learning brand new stuff for the first time. Expect it to last the whole time of class. Okay, so this is your reprieve. You don't have anything to do yet. It might have been your first class ever, so you have no homework that you should be working on, in which case I'll let you all evaporate. Fair enough? Okay, so I'll come around and help all of you, and we'll go from there.